Thanks for the wonderful introduction. For Peter. Um, thanks uh, to Sarah and Haim for the invitation. Um, absolutely delighted to be here. Can't quite say yet that I really enjoyed the conference. No offense to Peter, but <laughs> 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 it's a bit short. I'll talk for longer if you like. <laughs> <laughs> no, indeed. Okay, I'm going to tell you about a project that uh, has been going on for way too long in my lab. It's uh, one of the things where we submitted the paper and the reviewer came, came up with lots of really nice suggestions but that meant another two, week, two, two years of work and we're just about, we're finally finishing I think this project. In fact, my very last slide is a plot that was generated literally yesterday uh, and I think that's the last piece of data we want to generate from this. And it deals with learning uncertainty and confidence. Um, and uh, you may wonder why cho I chose that slide to illustrate uh, confidence, but uh, this guy here, he's standing in the middle of what's actually the west face of Half Dome in Yosemite. Uh, some of you may know him, his name is Alex Honold. He is the most famous right now uh, solo rock climber in the world. Uh, indeed, if you check his equipment, well, there isn't much. Uh, typically, when you're standing in a place like this, you you're carrying tons of equipment. The first few people who climbed this face took, uh, I think it was eight days on the face. For him, it's five hours uh, with a chalk bat, which you can barely see in some rock climbing shoes, and that's it. Um, so it's kind of a nice illustration of what you can do when you're probably too confident. <laughs> uh, talking about not planning through the back states. I think this guy is an expert at uh, underestimating his chance of dying and the consequences <coughs> of what's going to happen once uh, something bad happens. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about rock climbing. The rest of the talk is a little bit more generic. Uh, this is work I'm doing with uh, Zach Menon, uh, Andrew Mendoza, and Jan Drugovic. Jan in particular is heavily involved in um, all the theory here. Okay, so we're dealing with perceptual decision making. Uh, I'm always uh, I feel a little bit of pity for people every time I show this slide because we've all heard about this task so many times. But this is based on the decision making task that was recently designed by Bill Newsom and all his collaborators, in which uh, you present a set of dots to either a human subject or a monkey. Uh, and the subject has to tell you whether the dots are moving to right or left. So, in this particular case, uh, most of you should have perceived motion to the right. And the difficulty of the trial is controlled by percentage of dots, which is called the coherence, the percentage of dots that are moving coherently to the right or to the left. So if the dots all move randomly, the task is very difficult. If they all move coherently toward the right, then you have no problem performing the task. And in those kind of experiments, what is being typically measured is percentage of correct response as a function of coherence. And you can see how indeed perform the subject goes from chance to perfect as you increase the coherence, as you make the task easier. And you can also measure reaction time as a function of coherence. And there you see a pattern in which you have longer reaction time when the task is hard, and as the task becomes easier, the reaction times drop. And the way these kind of tasks are modeled is uh, what's known as uh, drift diffusion models or diffusion models, uh, in which uh, we imagine that we have a neuron or a set of neurons that are sensitive to motion to the right, and another set of neurons that are sensitive to motion to uh, the left. Uh, those neurons are stochastic, so over time they generate a sample that are drawn from a Gaussian distribution, so you see the activity of that neuron over time here, the solid line, and those are samples drawn from a Gaussian distribution whose mean is indicated by the dashed line and is proportional to the strength of the evidence, in this case, for rightward motion. And the same for the leftward motion neuron, so in this case you can see that the mean activity of the rightward neuron is above the mean activity of the leftward neuron. So this is an example of a trial where the motion is to the right. Okay, and the problem now is given all those samples that you're getting, how do you make a decision? And the way it's going to be done here is by taking the difference between the activity of the rightward and the leftward neurons and then accumulating those as difference over time. Right? So this leads to effectively a drift diffusion process you have a drift rate, which is determined by the difference in the mean uh, activity of the right and the left neurons. <coughs> uh, and uh, because the whole thing is stochastic, you're just stochastically diffusing with this drift rate here. And the way you make a decision is by hitting either an, uh, uh, 
bound uh, that's associated with right or one that's associated with left. So in this particular case, the process ends up concluding uh, right or motion. So that's one trial. You can repeat those trials with the same strength of motion and then just determine how many times you got it correct and how long it took you uh, to actually make a decision on every trial. And there are a bunch of free parameters in such models. Uh, by fitting the parameters, uh, you can easily fit and you can actually fit with exquisite precisions the kind of psychophysical data that has been collected on this kind of task, which is why those models have been so uh, popular. So this is an example here where you see how using a model like this, you can pretty much predict reaction times and percentage correct in a task like this one. Yeah. These models are pretty bad at predicting reaction time distributions. Uh, if you, yeah, it depends. It depends. There are so many variations. If you add a few parameters, you can typically even get the reaction time distribution. One parameter can get there. Eventually, eventually can get there. But with collapsing bounds and a variety of tricks, you can get to pretty nice gets to the. The problem with fitting the distribution is also getting enough data. Having played a bit that game with with Yann, it's well. So, so just uh, if I mean this, there's actually a linear drift here below the random separation. Yeah. And the linear drift is actually predictable by the decision itself and the, the, the KL divergence of the positive. I wonder how close is this neural data to this uh, optimal decision making, name and personal name. So there's no neural data here, sorry. You said neural data. It's just a simulation. This is just a simulation. And uh, Mike Shadman is spending uh, most of his career trying to argue that this is what the neurons are doing. But as you may know, it's a somewhat uh, controversial topic. I, I, not as Johnson Peeler will be here in two weeks, and you'll hear the full story and the full debate about this. Um, OK, so um, good. So th those models have been very, very popular, not just in, in perceptual decision making, but in, in a wide variety of tasks. Uh, they're indeed, I find them just incredibly uh, good at <laughs> predicting performance in all those tasks, given how few parameter they are. But uh, in almost all the versions that I know of, those models are typically developed for two inputs, and the weights here are basically assumed to be known. So in this case, it seems obvious that it should be a difference. Um, but we wondered, is there any way to extend those kind of models to a larger input neural population? Because after all, it looks like there is more than two neurons in the brain. And uh, also, if you, especially if you can have a large input neural populations, can you actually learn the weights instead of just setting them by hand? After all, this is also what subjects have to do. When you throw them in the task, they have no idea what's going to be the proper way of weighting the different neurons to solve the task that they're exposed to. So again, to just uh, collapse that into learning the different means and variants I'm not sure I got that solution. <coughs> Let me show you mine, and then we can come back to it if you think that's, that's a better way to go. Um, OK, so we're going to do it by having a bunch of neurons that are sensitive to whatever is your stimulus you're using. So if it's motion, this is just a population of neurons in MT with all sorts of tuning properties to direction of motion. Uh, we can assume that those are actually individual accumulators that are then pooled together to lead to one decision unit that is uh, corresponding to the drift diffusion process. So then T, they didn't Yeah, so there, this, this is not a neural model, right? So we could argue about whether there are individual accumulators or not. Uh, that's, uh, so you could think of those guys, if you like MT as being different LIP neurons with different tuning properties. But eventually, we imagine that they're pooled together. We get the decision unit that uh, simulates the drift diffusion process. And the big question is, how do you learn the weights W here, uh, given some feedback? So we're going to imagine on every trial you've been told whether you're correct or not on that particular trial. And for doing this, this is just a good old linear network. So this is uh, something that we're all familiar with. Uh, the first reflex will be, well, we know what kind of learning rules can give you the weights here. Just use the delta rule. So with the delta rule, you're going to update your weights on every trial according to the product of alpha, which is going to be your learning rate, times a postsynaptic error signal. So this is going to be the difference between what you're currently getting from your network Y of t and the feedback that tells you whether you were correct or not, times a presynaptic activity term. Very yeah, standard delta rule. So each of the exercises is accumulating evidence at different rates, different noises. I mean, what's 
They're, they're just uh, like standard action leaders. They just take, they're getting noisy samples and you just take the sum of, of, of their input samples. They're independent. The noise is independent. The, um, uh, the noise are independent. Uh, let's assume that they are. I'm not sure that our der derivation uh, would, would uh, not apply to the correlated case. No, but I mean, they must be different, otherwise you all the way yeah, they're all different. They all have different tuning properties. What is the target uh, Y is going to be <coughs> plus or minus one, uh, correct or incorrect, <coughs> and I multiply it by theta, which is the height of the threshold, which is why we, we denoted it this way. Okay? Okay, so that rule, well known, it works, it gives you the weights, but it just turned out that as we start thinking about applying it to drift diffusion mode, there's a slight complication, something that didn't look like a big problem at first, but turned out to require <coughs> a fair amount of work to be solved. And the problem is that with drift diffusion models, your error signal here is going to be binary. It can only take two values. Indeed, if you're on the correct trials, so let's say it's rightward motion and you end up concluding right, then um, your current state is the height of the bound here, and the feedback that you get is that bound. So the difference is zero, right? So if you're correct, your error is going to be zero. If you're incorrect, that means you end up on the other side of there. So that's your state. But the feedback tells you you should have been there. So now your error is going to be this difference, which is twice the, the uh, value of the, of the bound. Right. So why is that a problem? Well, that's a problem because it basically means that here you're ignoring confidence when you're learning. You're not taking into account your confidence. So if you were to plot how much you're learning here as a function of confidence, and know that I'm plotting confidence in a bit of a weird way, I'm going to have on this side incorrect trial, here correct, low confidence is in the middle, and then you have high confidence for correct trial in that direction, and high confidence in that direction for incorrect. Okay, but if you would now plot things that way and you look at how much learning do I get as a function of confidence, well, either you learn if you're on an incorrect trial or you don't if you're on a correct trial. Okay. So, 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 so you apply this rule only at the end of the process, not continuous. Yeah, I apply it at the end of every trial. At the end of every trial. Time, there was the function of time, there. but there is no function. Just you wait and see. Yes. I, I, I basically, on every trial, I wait until the decision ma made, I get a feedback, look at the difference, adjust my weights, and then again on every trial. It's, it would be an interesting question about how you would do it before you get any feedback. I mean, there are ways to actually do it with internal feedback. Okay, yeah, maybe it was, uh, maybe I just, that was a typo, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why is that about you? Well, let's just think of it intuitively. Confidence, it seems, should modulate your learning. So consider, for instance, an incorrect trial in which you were highly confident. Well, that's terrible news, right? You thought you were going to be correct, and you're highly confident about it. You got it wrong. That means you better change your weight as much as possible. On the other hand, if you're incorrect, but you have low confidence, then maybe it's because you just got bad data you should not necessarily blame your weight for it. So you should be a bit more concerned. And at the other extreme, if you're correct and highly confident, then everything is good. You don't need to change your weight. You did the right thing. So in 20D, you can kind of expect that learning should follow curves like this. And confidence should really improve your learning, and you're not going to get it from just a plain depth rule in this particular case. So we decided to go back to the drawing board and to start from scratch and derive the optimal learning rule for a drift diffusion model with feedback. And because we like Bayesian approach in lab, we decided <coughs> to uh, adopt a Bayesian approach and not just learn uh, uh, some mean weight. Uh, one more question. When you say optimal, you mean it should be it behave the best way or it should reproduce the data? What's the optimal? It should, in this particular case, that's a very important and good question. It should, it optimal in the sense of learning the weight as well as possible. So getting as close as possible to the true weight. The, the one that really... Um, hmm. It's the one that generates the data. So the way we do it, because we're doing a Bayesian approach, we have a set of weights that actually generates our data, and 
and we invert the generative model. So there is a set of weights that are actually the weights that are used. Uh, sure, that but the model in this case is identified as a unique, unique model that was generated. Yeah, but in this case it is. So yes. Yeah. Are there just two types of neurons, or some neurons are more informative than others? So the, the way the, the, the neurons are all different. They, 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 they are arbitrary response properties, so they have different amount of information. So they're not all equally right. yes. That, and that, is, that determines the optimal weights. Right? That determines the optimal weight. That's what I was going to say. You can think of it as the weight that optimizes performance, but like in terms of correct and correct. So you're optimizing performance. In this case, yeah. It's not derived exactly in this way. That's why I, I hesitate to state it in that way, because it's really derived from just a generative model. Okay, so the way we're going to do it is we're going to compute we're going to track a posterior distribution over the weights given uh, the input that we're receiving. It turns out, and you'll see in a few minutes, also given how long it took us to make a decision and the feedback. And you should think of this as the being the posterior distribution at time t, which we're going to update by updating the distribution, posterior distribution at time t minus 1. And I apologize for the notation because I'm going to say the posterior is the prior time likelihood term. The prior here, think of it as really the posterior at time t minus 1, at the previous time step. And so indeed, to get the way we get the posterior is posterior at time t minus 1 times the likelihood function. Okay, so this is completely standard based in approach. It turned out in this case that this distribution in particular is a community Gaussian likelihood, so it makes things intractable very quickly, at least for us. So instead, we're going to use an approximation fairly standard approximation in machine learning that's known as assumed density filtering or ADS for short. So whenever you see ADS, it's going to really refer to this particular learning rule. And in this case, what we do is we're going to, instead of computing the true posterior distribution, we're going to use, uh, we're going to compute a Gaussian approximation, which we find by minimizing the KL distance between the true distribution and the approximation. So at the end of the day, this is going to be a Gaussian distribution, meaning that at time t minus 1, it was also a Gaussian distribution. And then we minimize the KL. In this case, it's pretty simple. It's just a moment matching procedure. So we just match the mean and the covariance matrix of the distribution. And so with this, we end up with a learning rule, which is only updating two quantities. Because it's a posterior distribution, but it's a posterior distribution that's Gaussian, so it's characterized by its mean and its covariance matrix. So we have two learning rules, two update rules, on the mean and on the covariance matrix. So this is very interesting to be using a DDN because you know the weights are not, uh, you're upset about the weights. So for instance, why would you use a fixed threshold? Why would it, why would it be appropriate to use a fixed threshold decision making when you don't think the weights I don't have the answer to this. I think it's going to be, we need to start worrying about this. And, and we didn't quite do the full thing. <laughs> and I hope you're not going to be the reviewer on the next round with this paper. <laughs> that already delayed us by two years. But some <laughs> uh, Because we basically derived this rule after doing some work with some data where we didn't have the optimum rule. So we did the optimum rule, but I have to say I worry about this. It's then sh sh we should rethink about the, the optimal way of making decisions under this framework. Uh, you might wait longer to get some more information. That's it's that's it's cool. possible. Yeah, it's something that we need to look into. Okay, so um, keep in mind that now what we, we have is we don't have just one value of the weights. We have a Gaussian distribution, normal distribution of weights at any given time. And this is the update rule for the mean. I'm not going to show you the update rule for the covariance matrix, but we also run it. But here is how we update now the mean after each trial. And it's complicated, it looks pretty ugly, but uh, first of all, at the end here, we just have the standard presynaptic term, and we're just going to lump the rest into what we call a learning rate. Uh, note that the learning rate depends on feedback, so Y star appears, but at least you get that. And then there's this term that's kind of the critical term, which is a quantity which itself I'm not showing you, but it's a function of confidence. <coughs> And if I plot it, conveniently, it looks just like the plot I showed you before, where you see that this term here depends on confidence just the way that we would hope it would. It's very dimensionally strange. How you, what are your units of time? I see have time as a uh, component of the denominator. 
And so what's, what's the question exactly? What is the dimension of that, of that learning rate? So you know the, the, the denominator is time, right? But if you change the units of time, it will change time to 4t, right? And those are the other things on scale of that. So what's the, or are they same? Yeah, that I don't know. I would have to look back exactly how we wrote down CW. Uh, because there is, a de I wouldn't be able to write down CW from memory. Uh -huh. All I remember is that it, it looks pretty ugly, and that may be where, where we have the, the scale. So that's time after we've mentioned That's why I'm wondering whether this is time here or actually like iteration. So <coughs> <Or> iterations. <coughs> like, right, like we discretize time. That's, that's where I'm kind of clear exactly what the unit is. Okay, so we have now in CW a function of confidence, meaning that now learning is going to be influenced by this function. And you may ask, well, where does confidence come from? So if you're familiar with the, the work of uh, Kennedy and Shadlin, and we also had a nice paper with Jan Drigovich and Mike Shadlin on this, it turns out that for a drift diffusion model, um, confidence depends on elapsed time, how long it takes you to hit the bound. It turns out that in a test like this, where the difficulty varies from trial to trial, if you hit the bound quickly, you're typically dealing with a trial that was an easy trial, so you should be confident. If it takes a while to hit the bound, you're probably dealing with a trial in which the data was very crummy, uh, and so you should not be so confident. And indeed, if you see it uh, here, the confidence as a function of time, you see how it decays over time. So it depends on reaction time, and this is where actually this, this thing is quite complicated because it, time appears in here and it appears uh, at the bottom as well. Uh, second, it depends on the weight uncertainty. So remember that here our weights have a covariance matrix and if you're very certain of the weights, you see that the confidence is on average larger than if you're uncertain about the weights. So the weights do influence the CW function. It turns out that the uncertainty of the weights also appear uh, in the rest of the equation in a somewhat complicated way. And I, I cannot, I'm not going to tell you we understand every single aspect of that equation and exactly how it works. But we know that at the end of the day, this modulates learning in a way that's roughly of that shape, but not exactly because there are modulation by those other terms. But we have confidence weighted learning out of this approach. Yes? It's just as long as you understand finding confidence the way you did, right? only applies to a certain kind of very limited behavior when confidence relates on the action type relates on your confidence. It's a much more con uh, complicated issue. What is confidence? It's not making fast movement if you know it. Maybe making, not making movement. Maybe delay your movement. So measuring the, the way Shatten did is fine for Shatten experience not, not in general. Um, absolutely with you. We can redo this approach for so, so, so for any any kind of experiment that ah, you can think of. Question. It's not limited to this, but it just turns out in this particular case. You know, the delta rule, the delta term, the delta rule, you can think of it as already, already being a confidence kind of weighted term. Typically that's that's what it is. It's just that in the case of a GDM, because you're being binarized in, in the state of your system at the end of the decision, then you lose that aspect of the death rule. But there are many ways confidence could actually uh, um, influence how much you learn. <coughs> Here I'm telling you about the GDM one. I hope somebody's keeping track of time because I'm getting lots of questions during the talk. How much do I have? That's fine. You have another 20 minutes. Okay, I should be fine. I don't have that. Yeah. Really quick one. So, just yeah. and this slide really good for it because if your confidence is proportional to your reaction time, so high confidence will tend to be lower reaction time, the initial death rule does actually take into account confidence because <coughs> if you're super confident about a wrong decision, you'll be getting lots of updates per unit time fixing that, fixing those weights, right? Because you're very confident, you're hitting the bound very quickly, but in one second, maybe 10 times, it will change the weight tons of times. But if you're not so confident, it'll take longer, so you'll get much fewer updates. And the, the, so you want the confidence across updates here. Here we have the confidence influence every single update. But exactly, but that will show up as how often you're updating the weights because that you'll hit the bound faster if you're more confident, right? So yeah, we haven't thought about doing that way. So right now, you yeah, 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 across many across trials. trials. Yeah, here it's like single trials. Okay, so that was a lot of equation and information and that's a lot of questions. So let me summarize what this learning rule does at the end of the day. 
basically follow the following principle. The more confident you are about an incorrect decision, which is terrible, the more you're going to learn to try to correct your mistake. The more confident you are about a correct decision, the less we can learn, which makes sense. You were correct, confident, you don't learn that much. And the third principle, which is important, the more uncertain about you are about the weight, the more you're going to learn with this rule. Okay, which also makes sense. If you don't know anything about your weight, you have lots of uncertainty. When you get new data, you should learn a lot. Did I do my independent weights rather correlated? Your weights are correlated, right? Correlated distribution. Yeah, so and my weights are correlated. Yes. Uh, didn't we try to just like uh, approximate the distribution with. Uh, uh, no, we haven't. Okay. Yes. So the question is is there any behavioral evidence that people actually follow the first Yeah, so. Um, they should, right? Blank on this. Josh Gold has a bunch of experiments, actually, and not just Josh Gold, for how many else with Stan DeHaan have done a, a variety of experiments showing that uh, people seem to be taking into account confidence when they learn in just the right way. So, in that respect, actually, we're not the first one to point out that confidence should really influence learning. We're certainly not the first one. Uh, what's new here is really applying it uh, to a drift diffusion model. Okay, so. So that work. So first of all, just to convince you that at least in the simple setting, it learns the right weight. The way we quantify uh, the error of, the, of our system is we have some true weights, and those are the estimated mean of our weights, and we can look at the angle between uh, those two vectors as a measure of performance. Uh, this is a system with uh, two inputs. Uh, you have the angular error as a function of uh, number of trials. So you see that we learn there are really actually two curves here. One is our uh, technique, which is uh, I refer to as ADS, uh, which we compare to Gibbs sampling. So this is this is intractable. At least we can find analytical solutions, but at least we can do Gibbs sampling to try to get the best possible performance. And you see that ADS, even though it's an approximation, is just as good as Gibbs sampling on this. Um, what's nice about what we did is that it doesn't matter how many inputs you have. It works with five inputs. It works with ten inputs. Same learning rule. So, eventually it will go to zero. We're just not running it for very long. That's all. But it will go to zero. Uh, in this particular case, um, if the weight is static, yes. It turns out that this we have we can derive the same learning rule for drifting weights. So, if the true weights are drifting, then you never quite have time to convert. And that's going to matter because this is the learning rule I'm going to show you next when we apply it to real data. But if the weight are static, eventually you get there. Okay, so now let's compare it to uh, other rules. So going back to the simple delta rule, the first one that I showed you, uh, how well does it do? So this is the angular <coughs> error as a function of the number of trials. And uh, the problem with the delta rule, which uh, honestly few people really use, <laughs> Because one of the problems with delta is everybody knows that you have an issue with choosing your learning rate alpha. And indeed, in this case, if you try different values of the learning rate, what happens, uh, black is uh, ADS, that's our rule, uh, and the color here <coughs> are the different performance that we get from the delta rule by adjusting different values of the learning rate. And you see that for some of the learning rates, actually, we can even diverge, which uh, you get all the time. And by choosing careful the learning rate, you can get it to eventually go down but it's much lower than the ADF rule. Uh, and the problem with delta rule is that effectively it ignores the confidence in the decision and it also ignores the weight uncertainty. So the next best thing you could do is to cast a green descent on the log likelihood doing this. Uh, so this, this may not be obvious to everybody right away, but what we're doing here is we're going down uh, the gradient of uh, the likelihood function, and the likelihood function is the confidence turns out that's actually the definition of the confidence. So at least this one here takes into account uh, the confidence of the decision, but it doesn't have any representation of weight uncertainty. And that works definitely much better. Uh, if you pick the learning rate properly, so in this case 0.5 for this particular problem, you can get performance that approaches ADF, but only for that value, for other values of learning rate, uh, it's much, much lower. So if you think about the generative model, how does it generate the data given W? Can we do it offline? 
I know it's the confusing part, and 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 Jan spent a fair amount of, of time on this because it's it's not something I can explain in two minutes. That's why I'm, I'm hesitant to do it. But but this is exactly the part in which we spend a fair amount of time. Okay, so this is all the theory and a half. How much time I have left? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Perfectly on track. Um, I'm presenting the talk in reverse order. The reality is that we started with this experiment. We were trying to explain it. And then we realized we have to derive the learning rule. So we derived the learning rule. Um, but this is an experiment that was done with, again, in Zach's men's lab with Andrew and Dosha, in which the trained animal on olfactory tasks, and uh, the novelty with this particular uh, experiment is that they were really two tasks. So the animals, this is your typical kind of right experiment. The animal goes in the middle port here, the order is presented, and then the animal has to respond according to some rules, which I'm going to tell you about in a second by moving to the rightward port, the leftward port, and if it's correct, you get the rewards, and then it can reinitiate the trial. As I said, we have two tasks, a categorization task, uh, in which um, we're going to have a mixture of order A and B, which we vary from all A to all B, with mixture 50-50 in the middle, and the animal has to tell us there are more of A or more of B by moving right and left. The second task is going to be a detection task in which we have either A or B in different concentration, but no mixture, and the animal has to tell us, is this A or is this B? The thing to realize with those tasks is that uh, you may want to argue that they're actually the same task, because all we do here is we probe different parts of the perceptual space. So this plot here shows you the concentration of odor B here against the concentration of odor A. And in the detection task, what we're doing is we're basically moving along the axis here, changing the concentration of B while not having any A, and then uh, the reverse. Whereas with the categorization task, we're using mixture of odors. So we're actually moving that part of the perceptual space. But in both tasks, we're asking the animal, are you on the upper side of the diagonal or on the lower side of the diagonal. That's effectively the decision that the animal has to make. Okay, so we use a drift. So we're going to have chronometric and psychometric curve, reaction time and percentage correct for both staff in rats. And we use a drift diffusion model, just drawn differently from the one you saw before, but it's just a drift diffusion model for fitting uh, the, the behavioral data that we have. And if you do that and you take your DDM and you adjust the parameters, on the detection task, you might expect, since it's kind of the same task but in different part of the uh, sensory space, that this would immediately generalize to the other task, the categorization task. And the answer is no, it doesn't. So if I fit detection and then use the same parameters to see what it tells me for categorization, I get this. The solid line is a prediction, the dots is a data. And in particular, you see how the model predicts performance that's way, way better. Eventually it would drop to 50%, but it would be a dramatic drop here. But performance is predicted to be way, way better than the animal really is. Good. They are interjecting tasks. How does the animal know? We the have box? both. So uh, it turns out that because it's the same decision kind of uh, hyperplane, the animal doesn't really need to know. And we can do it interleaved, and they do it just as well as if we do it in separate. The data I'm showing you here is, is separate books, but we have fitted the interleaf to do as well. Okay, so this is something that uh, Zach made an observed a long time ago, six, six, seven years ago, and with Adam Kempach, they immediately thought, okay, so there's some extra source of variability in the categorization task. What could it be? So maybe it's noise in the brain, but uh, we start talking about it together, and um, my own sense is, well, before you give up and you say it's noise, perhaps we should explore other mechanisms. For instance, perhaps what's going on here is that there is learning going on, and that the reason there is some extra variability is because the animal is learning on every trial. Now, note, this is the wrong thing to do. In this task, after you've reached asymptotic performance, the rule of the task is not changing. The animal should just fix the weights and keep those weights stable. But the question is, how does the animal know that the task is stable? Animals live in a world that changes all the time. Their assumption should be things are changing, even in a task like this, simply because they don't have enough data to really tell that things are not changing. So the assumption here is that they keep on learning a little bit, even when they're in asymptotic performance. So we're going to extend the drift diffusion models by having 
two ways corresponding to the two units. We can also have a bias unit, so that gives us three weights here, and we can learn those weights. Those weights basically determine the decision boundary in the perceptual space, right? So if the weights are one, minus one, and zero for the bias, that's a diagonal, and that's actually the weights that those guys should be using for this task. But if they learn, then what's happening is this, this boundary is fluctuating from trial to trial. And that's going to introduce extra variability in the behavior of the animal. And maybe that's what's going on. That's what we're trying to test. <coughs> so indeed, if you expand them all that way, so now you have a learning rule which itself has a bunch of parameters, then if you fit detection, then you can also fit categorization with the same model, the same set of parameters. <coughs> okay. So it turned out that was learning what was that your your SD learning? It doesn't matter actually. It turned out that that's what I was about to say. It doesn't really matter which learning rule you use. Just fitting the chronometric and psychometric curves, almost any rules can do it. That's what we found. But the subtlety is going to come from an extra effect, which is what we call sequential effect. Effectively, what we see is that those animals have a strategy uh, where if they got rewarded on one particular side, then on the next trial, they're going to have a bias to go back to that side. And if they didn't get rewarded, then they have a bias to go on the other side. Win state loose shift. This is what people, uh, how people characterize it. And this here is a plot that shows you the bias toward the rewarded side uh, as a function, as it turns out, of the difficulty on the previous trial. And what's interesting is that, um, first of all, those biases, at least in the case of categorization, um, is dependent on the difficulty of the previous trial. I'm not going to go into the details of that. It's just an observation that there is uh, more of a bias when the previous trial was hard than when it was easy. And uh, you get a different pattern, more of a flat curve in the case of the detection task. And that, we thought, might be able to uh, really discriminate between the different learning rules. One of the good news is that when we were running the uh, ADS, or, or optimal learning rule on this, we immediately got the same pattern with that learning rule. But that's not good enough. If you look, actually, this one is a bit higher than it should be. So at this point, what you want to do is a full comparison across all the different rules using Bayesian model comparison. And that's literally the slide I got yesterday. Uh, we had a different version of this. And I apologize for the quality, and there's too many things. I didn't have time to ask Jan to redo it. Uh, we have everything at once. But this is Bayesian model comparison. This is with BIC. We've done it with AIC. We, we get the same results. Uh, we've done it with AIC corrected, the latest one. There are like a whole industry of those things. We get the same results, so at least we're confident about this. This is here relative uh, log light flows. This is all compared to the full ADF model, so order rule. Meaning that if you're above on this plot, you're doing worse than our optimal learning rule. Uh, this is uh, a model that actually is a really optimal model. This will be a rat that knows that the weights are static and therefore is not learning anymore once it's in steady state. And you see that this one actually goes really poorly. There is no way you can account for this data. It could not possibly account, for instance, for the sequential effect. This is a delta rule, uh, the one I showed you, but there are many different parameters I didn't tell you about, so we try all sorts of variations. And the depth rule is always above. It looks like it's barely above, but look at the error bars, because that's really what tells you whether you're well above or not. And it just does much worse than, than ADF. And this actually is a bunch of different variations of our ADF rule, where we remove the collapsing bound, or we add lapses, or we, we basically play with it, all the different parameters. And the nice thing about the basic model, model comparison is that it takes into account the number of parameters that you have. So the bottom line is that it looks like the animals here are using something that's pretty close to the optimal learning rule for this particular tab. I'm hesitant to make such a statement because, of course, we haven't tested every possible learning rule. But we, we are confident that they're not using just a, a plain vanilla delta rule here, that they're using something more sophisticated. And it looks like it's close to ADS, at least with the data that we have. Do you think the evidence is that, that they're actually slow? Then you conclude, and then it's going to be very short, and then we can get to your questions, because then I'm done. Uh, very quick summary of what I, I just showed you. Uh, we started with the problem of learning in a drift decision model, which led us to uh, this uh, learning rule that's uh, automatically confidence weighted, and I just showed you some data that seems to support the idea that uh, animals are 
are using Google along those lines in discrimination tests. Thank you very much. So, do you see any evidence that they're slowing down? So, to get this persistent learning, they have to believe that the world is changing. But maybe they can see the world isn't changing, so maybe they get better at understanding the world is not changing. So, do you see a change in the parameters over sessions? We haven't looked into it. My understanding from talking to these guys is they don't see that. So, those animals really, once they're in a steady state, the behavior is pretty much stationary. But we just haven't looked into it. I, you know, I always wondered about this question. How quickly does it take to figure out that the world is static when you come with that's all going to depend also on your prior, right? And the problem is we don't know what kind of prior they have in their mind. Uh, but I would not be surprised. And the second issue is how much more reward are they going to get if they actually make the right assumption? And uh, in our hands, I know, the I was just thinking about this. Given that plot, maybe it would be a lot. I would have to re re look into this again. But that's always the issue with it in our hands. <coughs> It's, there's not that much more reward to get. I'm, I'm a bit confused. That the last slide you showed that non-stationality in behavior plays an important role, a role in the behavior of the animals. So you started by saying that the, drift, the standard drift diffusion model is a very good model predicting behavior of animals. And this, when fitted independently in each condition. So, how can these two observations live together? I don't think I'm getting your question. Let me try and rephrase it. So the drift diffusion model, you presented two training or, or two procedures uh, uh, for testing uh, detection uh, in these animals. Two different tasks, yes. Yeah. Two different detection tasks. And the drift diffusion model is a very good model uh, explaining each one of them separately, but yes. with different parameters. Yes. But it turns out that uh, uh, animals are not stationary. So how come that the drift diffusion model uh, explains behavior so well when fitted on one of these tasks? I mean, even in one of these tasks, learning still plays a role. Sequential effects still play a role. Um, so I wonder actually what would happen is, so what happened is basically you have enough parameters to capture the, 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 the data. So we could have, we could fit single conditions, single tasks, with a learning rate as well, using the learning rules. I'm thinking we haven't done that Bayesian model comparison, and I don't know whether we have enough data to justify using a learning rule to account for the data. It turns out that you know, as, as powerful as DDMs are, when you look at the data, if you're only fitting a psychometric and chromatic curve, those curves are very smooth. If you think about how many parameters do I need to capture this behavior, uh, I see somebody going with mm -hmm. two or three. Yeah, it's about two or three. Even though I may have like ten data points in those in those plots, there are only two or three degrees of freedom. So with a single condition, if you have a model that has more than two or three parameters, you're very unlikely. I mean, uh, you're very likely to be able to tell the difference between a model that has two or three three parameters versus five or six. So this would be a problem. So this would imply that the evidence for drift diffusion model is a good model for for. The decision making is actually pretty weak. I, I, yes, I would partly agree with it. I think that as successful as it's been, again, if you look at the curves, they don't have that many degrees of freedom, which is why in this case we have two tasks and we do the sequential effects. The sequential effects, they are like they are conditioned psychometric curves. So at the end, we're feeding um, one, two, three, uh, six different psychometric curves and six different chronometric curves. So now we have enough data that we can test and, and discriminate between different models with more parameters. If you do it on the original experiment, forget it. It's not enough. Unless you do maybe the reaction time distribution, which is a nightmare. Showing back to Peter's question. Okay, uh, I guess uh, we should go on to the most important part of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> we should reconvene at 11.40.